Joy unspeakable and full of glory. What great words of encouragement this morning. Can you tell that to your seatmate this morning? You are full of glory. Abi? Or maybe you're just half of what's, un what's untold. The Word of God tells us that, that Christ is changing us from what? Glory to glory. Galing ito, gata daw ay glory nga glory how? The opposite, hindi man we praise the Lord for this opportunity this morning to be gathered around His Word. We praise Him for even the songs just ministering into our hearts this morning. Reminding us that the God we serve, the God that we worship, is the God of Abraham. And He deserves all the praises and the glory and the honor. Please take your Bibles, dear brethren, this morning, and let's open it up to the book of Revelation. We have been studying the book of Revelation, chapter 1, since we've, we're here together. And the last sermon was about the vision of the, of the Son of Man. That's taken from Revelation, chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. The vision of the Son of Man. So before we dive into the next sermon this morning, let's review a little bit what we learned the last time we were here. Here are some key points from that sermon. We had five points last time, and the first point we discussed was John's condition. John's condition in verse number nine, we said that he was exiled into the island of Patmos because of the testimony that he had for the, the work of the ministry and for the testimony he had of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we said that the island of Patmos was a barren land. It was a land of suffering. It didn't have any vegetation. Indeed, it was a perfect place to imprison someone. And John was already old during this time. It was a harsh, harsh environment for the dear apostle. But the second point was John's transportation in verse 10 to 11. And here we pointed out the vision that God gave unto him. He said in verse number 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. We said he was not dreaming, he was fully awake. And so this was a vision given to him. He was given the opportunity to rise above what we can see as human beings. And he was given the opportunity to see the future. And so we go to the next point, which was John's description. He described through that vision what he saw. And primarily what he saw was the Son of Man standing in the midst, in the midst of the churches. That's what we can see there in verse number 20. The mystery of the seven stars, which are, which are the, the, the pastors and workers, right? Which thou sowest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. And the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sowest are the seven churches. And the Word of God tells us in verse number 13 that the Son of Man is there in the midst of the church. He's in the midst of the pastors and workers of the church, telling us that He is truly in the presence of His church. He is in control. He's the leader. He's the head of the church. That's what John saw. And he described Christ in, in, in words that were powerful. The fourth point that we have from that sermon was we discussed John's reaction to what he saw. And we, we read in verse number 17 that when he saw the vision, he fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And we said John was not able to contain himself. You see, when you see God in His glory, I don't think you'll be able to stand before Him like a proud man. You will be humbled. You will see yourself as, as unworthy of His presence. You will, I believe, like John, fall on the ground and worship Him. But Jesus' consolation was the last point there on verses 8, 17 to 18 when Christ touched John and He told John, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and death. 
And the conclusion of that sermon was, when John saw the glory of God, the ending of this passage was right. John, stand up, right. In other words, God, Jesus Christ, has some work for him to do. And so that's exactly what John did. He wrote the rest of the book of Revelation. Now, I know I promised you last time that when we return here and study the Word and open the Word, we will discuss the first church. But as I prayed and studied and searched the Scriptures, I realized maybe we could do that next time. But at this point, we will just have what we call a, a, a bird's eye view of the coming chapters, chapters 2 and 3. We will jut through the seven churches. Like we were, we're going to look at the seven churches in a general way first before we go into an in-depth study of the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. So that's exactly what we are going to do. We're just going to have an overview this morning of the seven churches. Let us observe what we can learn from chapters 2 and 3 in a jet through manner. That means quickly. We're just going to quickly study the passage here in our Bible. And so as we do that, let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes as we ask the Lord for wisdom. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word. Father, we are so privileged to be able to handle your word, to open it freely. This is a powerful book. This is your inspired, inerrant book. This is your gospel. And so I pray that you will teach us to approach this with such humility. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds. Guide us by the Spirit. Help us to learn. I pray that everyone will be able to focus on your voice this morning. So guide each one of us that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And may our lives bear fruit, O Lord, through the ministry of your word in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Dearly beloved, let's open our Bibles, please, in the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3. We're just going to go um, through it this morning quickly. Let's begin with discovering where these churches were located in the, in the past. And so we have a map here. On our next slide, I don't know if it's clear there with you, but you can see the seven churches arranged there in Asia Minor. You see here, the first one on the coast, we have Ephesus, the city of Ephesus, then Smyrna on the north, then on the topmost portion there, we have Pergamum or Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And you can see there, if you can put lines to connect the dots, they make a U. And that's exactly how the Apostle John wrote his letters. Actually, not his letters, but the letters of Jesus Christ to them. He starts with Ephesus, then he goes to Smyrna and Pergamum, going down to the last church in Laodicea. That's how the, the letters here unfold. And then we see here the list of the churches and, and what commentators and preachers of the gospel would like to summarize them with. And so first, we have the church in Ephesus. And the church in Ephesus is called the Loveless Church. The church who left their first love. Then we have the second church, which is the church in Smyrna. And the church in Smyrna is called the Persecuted Church. The Persecuted Church. And then we have here next is the church in Pergamum or Pergamos. The fourth is the church of Thyatira. Then we go to chapter 3 where we have the church in Sardis. And then chapter 3 verse 7, we have Philadelphia, the professing church, a church that professes to be the true church of Christ. And then the last church is the church of Laodicea where we have here the final state of apostasy or leaving the doctrines of the gospel of the Word of God. So this is how the churches are being unfolded here in chapters 2 and 3. 
Now we want, we would like now to to see what are the commonalities in the three or in the in the two chapters we have. As you study these two chapters, chapters two and three, you will see that in the letters of Jesus Christ to all these seven churches, and you compare them, you can truly see that they have commonalities, similarities. And that's what we're going to dwell this morning. We have three similarities. We have three observations here this morning. And if you may, please, go to chapter 2, verse 1, as we go to our first observation. Chapter 2, verse 1 tells us this, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. Chapter 2, verse 8, jump. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write. Jump to t- verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write. Jump to chap- uh, verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write. Chapter 3. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis, write. Verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write. Chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write. Dearly beloved, the first observation we can find here as Christ writes these letters to the seven churches, he opens with the words to the angel of the church in right. In short, these letters were addressed to the angels of the churches. You can see it there clearly. To the angel of the church. To the angel of the church. These seven letters were written to the angels of the church. Now, the question is this then. Who are the angels of the church? Who were these people? Were they real angels that we have a concept of right now in Hollywood where they have, they have these this, this, this wings and, and they have these different ideas of angels? Well, angel here in the Greek literally means messengers. Messengers. And in the church program of God, in ecclesiology, if you study the church, this could only refer to the office of the pastor. So the word here, angel, angel, does not connote the, the, the created beings of Christ to serve them in the heavens, like angel Gabriel. No. What Christ was emphasizing here, he was writing primarily to the pastor or shepherd of the church. The angels were never the leaders of the church. The pastors are. The under-shepherds are. The bishops are. And so, this is related to what verse 16 in chapter 1 tells us. Let's revisit chapter 1, verse 16. According to John here, his vision, he, Jesus Christ, had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And and verse 20 explains who are these seven stars. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sowest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. Here, John explains who are the seven stars. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So they are connected. The seven stars are the same with the seven angels, which are here the pastors, the church leaders. And this is to whom Christ was writing to. You know, this is very unique. Because if you study the other epistles, the other letters, like Pauline epistle, like when Paul wrote to the church in Corinthians, in Corinth, and and, and in Ephesus, and in um, Thessalonica. If you read those epistles, the letters of Paul usually addressed, were addressed to the church themselves as a whole. Saints, church, brethren. But here in the book of Revelation, it's specifically addressed to the pastors. Very unique. And so we ask, why? Why this difference? Why is is it not the same with the other epistles? I believe as I study this, that these letters were written to them because Christ here is emphasizing the accountability of the pastors of the churches to Him as the head of the church. We know, according to Ephesians chapter 5, that there is only one head of the church. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. The Word of God tells us here that 
for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body in short dearly beloved what Christ is saying here is that yes I am the head of the church Christ is the chief shepherd but he places these pastors these bishops these under shepherds under him to be the leaders of the church that he has and they are accountable to him someday we pastors will stand before God's throne and we will take account on how we led his church interesting not the deacons not the board of trustees not the Christian education director not somebody who's the richest in the church no not someone who's the biggest tithe no yes they may come before God and be accountable before God as as far as their ministries are concerned but someday we pastors will stand before God and we will take in account how we led his church that's a staggering truth that's a very important truth that we pastors must never forget and that's why the, the Word of God is plain on to how we should lead the church you know we studied this in the seminary we had the, the, the class called the pastoral epistles where we were taught there by our teacher what, uh, what are the expectations of Christ for a pastor. I have several here. This, like, this is not exhaustive, but I will outline this according to the names, the titles of a pastor. The first title of a pastor is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 12. The Word of God tells us here, for the perfecting of the saints, Let's start with verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The first title here that we have is what we call pastor teacher actually if you look at the original greek manuscript here there's no difference between the pastors and the teachers in fact the title there go together here in the king james it says pastors and teachers but in the greek it says pastor teacher they go together that means dearly beloved that we are accountable as pastors on what we teach to you we need to be able to, to, to teach you the entire counsel of God. We cannot separate ourselves from being a teacher and being a pastor. We cannot say, oh, I'll just lead the church, I will not teach. No. Because that's the responsibility of a teacher, of a pastor teacher. I also cannot say, I'll just teach, I won't pastor the church. No. Because they go together. We ought to be both. Therefore, a godly pastor is a teaching pastor. If you want to truly pastor the flock of God, there is no other way to do it but to teach. Teach the what? The Word of God. And that's why we have a lot of programs here in the church. We're encouraged to give the Word of God diligently. The second title that we have in the Word of God is the title called Bishop. We don't use it here most often in our church, but this is a term used in the King James translation in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 and 2. The Word of God tells us here, this is a true saying, if a man does desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless and we have here the qualifications of being a bishop now this word bishop comes from the Greek word to mean to inspect to superintend so that's another ministry of a pastor we're supposed to superintend to inspect to be in control of what's happening in the church that's our responsibility another title of a pastor is what we call the, the title elder 
First Peter chapter 5, verse 1. 1 Peter 5, verse 1. The Word of God tells us, The elders which are among you I exhort, says Peter, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. And verse 2 tells us, Feed the flock of God which is among you. Now, verse 3, Neither as being lords over God's heritage but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. The term elder literally means old. Now, there are pastors who are young. And there are pastors who are middle-aged, those who are very advanced in age. And even at the seminary, being a first-year student there when I was there 14, 13 years ago, we were already assigned to different churches that do not have pastors. And as a 16-year-old, as a 17-year-old, that's tough. Because they are the ones really pastoring the churches. They go to their first weekend center, and when they go to the pulpit, they don't even have any training yet as far as preaching is concerned. They're just really teenagers. They stand behind the pulpit, and their knees are knocking against each other because they're so scared. They don't know what to do. So there are levels of, of, of ages of pastors. And I praise the Lord. But even here in our church, we don't despise the youth, even as being pastors. We respect the calling of God into their lives. I'm one of those who has experienced that here. And I thank the Lord for that testimony of Don't Baptist Church. But here, the word old does not necessarily mean age, but of spiritual maturity. In short, it is expected of us pastors to be spiritually more mature. It will be a shame if we pastors are, are more, we have members who are more mature than us. That's why the Word of God tells us, as Paul reminded Timothy as a young pastor when he started, he told Timothy these words, Timothy, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example. Because he knows Timothy is young, but he's already pastoring a church. And so he encouraged Timothy, Timothy, if, even if you're young, even if they are older pastors, listen, you can be an example to them through your life, through the love that you have for the saints, through your purity. And that's expected of us as elders. And the last term here, name that I'd like to tackle head on as far as the name of pastors is that sh the word, the name shepherds. Shepherds. Of course, we read here in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 4, that Christ is the chief shepherd. And we hear this sometimes that the pastors are called the under shepherds. We are the under shepherds of the flock of God. And here we have read a while ago that as shepherds, we ought to feed the flock of God. Because someday we will face the chief shepherd. And we will be held accountable with what we do with the church, with how we lead the church, how we teach the church. Dearly beloved, this is a hard sermon to preach, knowing that as I was studying this, there's a constant searching of our lives as pastors. There's a constant comparison of our practical Christian living, even of our secret lives, into this qualification of a pastor. Let me tell you, it's never easy to pastor a church. I've only been in the ministry for 10 years. I had the privilege to talk to some pastors who have, who have served for 30, 40, 50 years. Last week, I was privileged to preach with a senior pastor. And I was so, so happy to be able to sit down with him for lunch, for, for dinner, for breakfast. And he was teaching me what he has gone through in the ministry. The difficulties, the learnings. And one thing that came out of his, of his words were this, was this advice. He said, you need to stay in the Word. Preach the Word. 
and give the glory to God. There will be a lot of sufferings, he said, but you press on. Of course, dearly beloved, you always see us on Sunday looking spiffy with our barongs and coats and ties. But let me encourage you, the church of Christ this morning. As what you can see now, there's a greater accountability to us, the church leaders, the pastors. Please pray for us. That's the first challenge. Pray for your pastors. I hope every time you have your, your, your family devotion, you include the pastor in your family devotions. You pray for us. We need your prayers. The battle is fiercest in the front lines of the battle. And we are there in the front line. We are all in the battle together, yes, but we are there in the front line. And we need your support. We need your prayers. But second, I would like to encourage you to please also encourage us. Sometimes we also get discouraged, you know. Sometimes we also get disappointed. We try our best to, to smile, the best smiles we can when we're here. So that we are able to minister to you. But I hope you also understand that we are also people who get discouraged sometimes. A pat on the shoulder would do. Some words of encouragement like, Pastor, we're praying for you. Pastor, we're behind you. Pastor, we're attending this program. Even that will greatly encourage us. But the third is to train our pastors. Knowing that we have greater condemnation, we have a greater accountability before God, I hope you will see to it that we, your pastors, will continually have continual education. And we thank you for that. We have a budget for that here in the church. I hope you encourage our pastors to go and attend conferences and seminars and trainings. We need to grow. If you want us to be the better pastors we should be, encourage us to do that. And I praise the Lord, this church supports that. I hope you'll continue that. Because we need to grow as pastors as well. The fourth encouragement is support your pastors. We have a lot of programs here in church. We have been praying and preparing, especially even for our church anniversary. Oh, I hope you will join. Your presence is an encouragement to your pastor. Do you know that? Now, when we gather, we say we're going to gather and worship the Lord and praise the Lord for His goodness, and you come, your presence is already a great encouragement, I'm telling you. And then the fourth, or the fifth, having said all of those things about the pastors and our responsibility, I also encourage us, if you have something to tell your pastor, any positive or, or if you need anything to suggest, please approach your pastor. Rather than going behind his back and talk behind his back and make chica chica against him or destroy him to other members, we would greatly appreciate it as your pastors. Approach us. Talk to us. We would rather have you talk to us personally and tell us what is needed to be changed, what you think is best, what you think is better, then we'll never be able to know because you never came to us. That will greatly encourage us. So see, see the letters were written to the pastors. But of course, the pastors are to relay the letters to the members. That's the first observation. The letters were addressed to the angels, the pastors. The second observation is this. It was written by Christ who knows. It was written by Christ who knows. And we see here as we, as we jet through these two chapters again, in chapters 2 and 3, there are words that say, I know thy works in chapter 2 of, of verse 2. And then verse number 9, I know thy works and tribulations. And then verse number 13, I know thy works and where thou dwellest. And in verse 19, I know thy works. And then chapter 3, that is common 
that's, that's, that's what we can see in all of these letters telling us that the Christ who wrote this letter truly knows what's happening in the churches. Sometimes we, we ask ourselves, is Christ really here in our midst? Is Christ really joining us? Is Christ really here working in our, in our hearts? He is. Sometimes you may say, I don't feel it. I can't see it. Listen, in a spiritual realm, sometimes God will not let us see it. Christ will not let us feel it because Christ operates more than our senses. Sometimes we need an evidence. Sometimes we need to hear. We need to see. We need to smell. We need to, to really taste. But the Word of God tells us the just shall live by faith. The Christian life is only operable when you live by faith. And you live by faith on the Word of God. And the Word of God tells us that Christ standeth in the midst of His church. Verses 12 and 13 of chapter 1. John said, I turned and see the voice of, of the, the one that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Listen, Christ is here. Christ knows what we are doing here in Dome Baptist Church. Christ knows what we desire as a church, and Christ knows each one of us personally. You might, be, you might be sitting down there and you're thinking, does Christ really know what I'm going through? He does. Does Christ know my problems? He does. Does Christ know your struggles? He does. He knows the sin that continually besets you. He knows that struggle we have with your family, with your wife, with your husband. The problem you have with your children. The problem you have with your relatives, your business, everything about you, God knows. That's why here in the letters, He keeps on repeating, I know, I know, I know. But the point here is this. With this word, no, I looked at it in the original um, language of this and it's very interesting it has two meanings the first meaning there is to gaze with wide open eyes he's looking with wide open eyes and then the second meaning is this to stare in order to discern clearly it's different that you're just, you're just looking like that, but it's also different when you're truly staring and looking at the minutest details. That's Christ. He looks with a gaze with an open wide eyes, like a panoramic view, but he also looks as if he has a microscope and looking at the tiniest details of the church. So in two ways, Christ knows the works of the church. First, outwardly the works of our hands our numbers how many we are the business of the church in the ministry outwardly he knows that but also inwardly he knows our intentions he knows our motives he knows our hearts there is nothing that we can keep from Christ and this is the warning for us. Here in the churches that he wrote to, the letters, he would say the works, he, I know thy works, but I also know the motives, the heart. Because with Christ, as the head of the church, both the work and the motive behind the work of his church are important to him. Let's not just get busy for business sake. Let's not just be doing everything with our hands, but always also be careful with our motive. And this is a reminder for those who serve Christ here. If you're involved in a ministry, whatever they may be, Sunday school, choir, discipleship, whatever ministry you may have, ask yourself this, why do you serve? Are you serving because you think God will bless you more? Because if you serve, that's what's going to happen? Are you getting involved because you are praying for something? You're praying for a car, you're praying for a house, and so when I serve God, then He will give me what I want? Is that your motive? 
Or maybe you're here serving because I want to be involved in a big church. I want my fame to be resounded. Brother, sister, God knows that. Christ knows that. But also, this is a warning to those who do not serve. And the question is, why aren't you serving? What's the reason behind you're just sitting down there? Not getting involved in the ministry of Christ. What's your reason? What's that most important reason that you can give to Christ that you cannot serve Him? Christ says, I know, I know, I know. But the third observation, not only that Christ wrote to the angels, to the pastors, we are held accountable. It was written by Christ who knows. He knows the works of the church. But third and last, it was sent with a call to repentance. This common, these common words that we see at the last portion of the letters. Chapter 2, verse 7. He that hath, hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. It repeats again, verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Again and again, in those seven letters, Christ would repeat those words again and again. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. In other words, Christ was sending these letters with a call to repentance. Of course, out of the seven churches, five were rebuked by Christ with the exception of Smyrna and Philadelphia, the persecuted church and the true church. Imagine, seven churches, only two were not persecuted. Five, I mean, five were rebuked. Only two were not rebuked. The first church was rebuked because they left their first love. They were busy, but they left their first love. They were going through the motions, the traditions of men. But innermost in their hearts, there's no love. Church of Ephesus. Church of Pergamum. The church who compromised. They did not stand on the word of God. And God, Christ, rebuked them. And then we have the church in Thyatira. The corrupt church. They let all these doctrines that are wrong come into the church. Teachings that are humanistic teachings that are pagan, they let it come in. Then the church in Sardis, one word for the church, dead. That's a description of Christ. You are a dead church. And then the church in Laodicea, they were rebuked because they were lukewarm. Christ says, it's better to be really, really hot or to be really, really, really cold. But you are neither. You are not hot. You are not cold. You are lukewarm. And Christ says, I will spew you out. The five churches that were rebuked. Called to repentance. You know, yesterday, as I was flying back to Iloilo, I, I had a, a, a friend. I made a friend who's a preacher, a Baptist preacher from Canada. I noticed his shirt had a, had a verse on the back. I can't, I can't remember what the text was, but it says something to call to repentance. And so when we were waiting for our bags, I, I talked to him. I said, brother, are you a preacher of the gospel? And he said to me with a very deep voice, he was a very big guy. I was looking up like that. Yes, I am a preacher of the gospel. No, me too. And we shook hands and then they said, yeah, I, my pastor is here, even a bigger guy. They were going to Antique, they said, to, to, to a camp there. They, they bought a piece of land there and they're going to do a camp for the teenagers. And he asked me where I was pastoring. And he said, we need to continue to preach the gospel of repentance, brother. It's no longer being preached. Because if you preach the gospel of repentance, you know what will come out to? Not just members of the church, not just, not just churchgoers, but the money also goes out of the church. Because the church sometimes just loves to be, to be taught the good things, the goodness of God. But the repentance to sin says no. And this is exactly what the warning of the, of the letters of Christ was. Mark Arthur said something like this. 
He has yet to see a church as a whole, starting from the leaders to the members, to repent. It's very interesting because these are churches of Christ, really. These are true saved Christians. But they, are, they were called to repent. And so the question this morning is this. Could it be also that we should listen intently to Christ and maybe repent in some of our ways? As a church? As individuals? Should we consider looking at how we do ministry and how, how we see our church to be going? And if we see that we're not going in the right direction, we need to repent. And we need to be on the right track. Because even these churches, these seven churches, were sent a call to repentance. He who hath, he who hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So the conclusion this morning is this. I'm borrowing the words of Mark Arthur. He said, although these seven churches were actual historical churches in Asia Minor, they represent the types of churches that perennially exist throughout the church age. What Christ says to these churches is relevant in all times. That means Dome Baptist Church, friends, brothers and sisters, when we tackle these churches, these coming Sundays, these seven churches, may we not say to ourselves, oh, that's true to them in the past. No. But may we tackle these verses and search in our hearts. Are we like that? Can I see myself there? May we with broken hearts test our lives and compare them to the words of the Apostle John. Where am I? Where are we as a church? I hope that as we tackle these churches, we will become so intentional in telling the Lord, Lord, Help us to be the church you want us to be. Help us avoid being like these churches. And may we pursue what you want us to be today. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And I pray that you'll continually bless our church. You are the chief shepherd We are the pastors whom you have given to this church with our senior pastor, Pastor Bam, as he leads us. May you continually shower us with the wisdom, with the heart to truly be the church that we ought to be. And I pray that your word, as we study these seven churches this coming Sundays, we will be able to see areas in our ministries, areas in the church as a whole where you still want to change. Maybe you want to cleanse us, better us, mold us more so that truly, Lord, we can soar greater heights for your greater honor and glory. So I pray, even for our board of trustees and deacons and all those who serve here, unite our hearts. And let us see why we are truly here in this place. May we truly obey the great commission of sharing the Gospels and making true disciples of Christ. In Jesus' name, I commit this prayer. Amen.